Everyone, hi, Bruce Lofson, LCSW, Sunridge of Nevada, coming at you with another music video. Tonight's artist, Kid Cudi, the song Mr. Solo Dolo 3 from Men on the Moon 3. Uh, he's one of my favorite artists, and for all the comments we've gotten from you guys, one of yours as well. Uh, the man's a genius, how he uses, how he infuses everything with his own unique style. That's what I want to explore tonight. So without further ado, here we go. We're going to get into it right away. The intro to me was very powerful, and I've noticed that he does this very, very well. He waits a long time before he actually starts the lyrics. It's almost like a 51, 52 second burst of music first, before you hear the chorus. Then you're looking at the animation thinking, how is this going to play itself out? And he puts you on edge with the sound of people screaming. That continues throughout the intro, and then you have the piano in the background. And then you hear the synthesizer, and then you go right into the chorus. And to me, he's a master of creating mood to set up the song to get you sucked into it. To me, he is saying, here is how I got sucked into this nightmare, and that it's a this world is an endless nightmare for me, and it's an endless loop for me. So now people have asked also, it comes out that this uh, song that he did, no, the animation, I'm sorry, the video that he did, covers all the songs, granted. But this is what I took out of it from this particular song and how I'm going to break it down. Here's how he sets it up. It's interesting. You got Kid Cudi, Man on the Moon 3, The Chosen. You get the first situation, you know, you get that, like that highlight. Okay. The first one is you get half the face. The implode, you get the zero, the moon, the O, and he's falling. He's falling backwards. The second one again, you get the half face, the implode, you get the moon, you get the eye. Now you're getting the eye, and it's overlooking the city. Okay. What I got from that was I am failing in my life and I'm falling. I'm falling out of control. And I'm looking through my eye at my falling and feelings in the city over my issues. Like, you know, I'm, this is what I'm dealing with. This is who I am. This is what I've turned into. And kudos to Kid Cudi for his guts and his honesty and being someone who's actually able to, now say able to, who's tried to confront his own issues of mental health by being brutally honest about it. And so few people ever are when it comes to these kinds of issues. Here we go into the lyrics, Mr. Solo Dolo 3. Now, I'm not going to do every line of the song. It's only the ones I, as always, the lines that I find the most pertinent and the most interesting to me. He goes like this. Yeah, I take it. They don't know about it. Yeah, I take it. I don't need nobody. Meaning, they don't know and have no idea on how I am really feeling. I take the pain, the embarrassment, and the shame because I want to believe I don't need anyone. Classic, you know, number one issue with addiction. You do need people. Everyone thinks with addiction, like, I could beat it. No one knows. It's not a big deal. It's amazing how people I talk to in the course of my week that really are in a in, an illusion and the only delusion they're creating is for themselves with I don't need anybody Bruce I can handle it on my own I don't need any help you need help you can't do it alone okay next thing it goes like this deep in hell in dark corners deep in my dreams perceive nah your dreams become your nightmares that's what happens since my face explodes this is how I see my existence. Then you go with this. Yeah, I take it. They don't know about it. Yeah, I take it. I don't need anybody. And then you throw in there. You can't hear me scream something twisted in me. You can't hear my screams because I am unable to let them out to be heard. My common sense, my sanity, I can't clear it out. Something's twisted in me. I can't get to the core of what's causing me to be dysfunctional. I can't get to the core of why am I doing this to myself? Why am I being so self-destructive? And that's something you get very common in addiction is to try to get to the core. It's hard. 
you know, what's twisting me? What is wrong with me that I keep on doing insane things to hurt myself, of course, but everyone around me is like, what's wrong with this person? Okay, then you go like this. Um, say I'm waiting to die, I cry. Many nights I spent getting blanked up, living a lie. Because that's exactly how addicts feel. Is this going to be the day that I die? Talk to enough people who, you know, have to do things on the street to survive. And that's a common theme that comes out of people's mouths. Is this the day that finally I overdose, I get beaten to death, I get shot, killed, any which way of dying? Am I going to wake up, you know, dead? Is it over? Do I need to have another hit of Narcan? Is this the day that I finally hit my rock bottom? The lie is that I am in control when it's obvious to everyone but yourself that you're not in control. You know, you lie, you lie to yourself. No, 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 I got it, I got it. We have people, you know, comment to us, those comments like, Bruce, you know, I'm amazing, I'm incredible, but I have an addiction to drugs, to alcohol. No one knows. Uh, okay, only one that doesn't want to know is you because you don't want to admit it to yourself, but everyone knows what's going on. There's no confusion about that. Then I want to go to the next line. You could try and read my mind. Because and that's another thing, too, I've learned is a waste of time doing counseling. I can't read your mind. you got to be honest. Because often if I, what I think is the problem, I don't get it. Now, I have enough experience and enough knowledge to start saying things like, was there sexual abuse? Was there physical abuse? Was there embarrassment? Did something happen to you? Like, why would you start doing heroin at the age of 13? Why would you continue to abuse meth when you know how destructive it is for you? So what's going on? But I can't do it. I can't do it unless you're going to meet me at least halfway to give me something to work with. Okay, because often you don't have the slightest clue. Been pushing it for days. I'm on a mission to climb. Whoa. Yeah, I'm pushing it for days. Yeah, I'm going to figure it out. More drugs and alcohol. You know, I think that I'm flying, but I'm reality just crashing. I'm fooling myself. This is really what the whole song is really kind of expressing, is that for all that we think we know, all that we think we're fooling other people around us, you're just fooling yourself. Okay. Losing reality. Been saying I'm fine. Try my hardest to sleep. Too many issues bubbling. Say I'll work through it. Losing your reality is the first thing that goes. It's called drug-induced psychosis. What is drug-induced psychosis? It mimics schizophrenia. When you start like talking to yourself, you become very delusional. Your brain becomes basically fried. You fight sleep till you literally will just fall asleep. I've had that happen to me in the past. I know from my, I remember I had a job where I worked 11 at night to 7 in the morning. No matter what I did to try and stay awake for my shift, it was an eight-hour shift. 5.30 in the morning, I literally would feel my eyes do this, just shut on me, close on me. And I have to fight sleep till like 6 o'clock I got a second wind. I was exhausted. That was a terrible shift for me. But when you're, when you're fighting reality, fighting sanity, you keep on taking the next, ro you know, next hit of meth. The next, let me stay awake. Let me stay awake. Let me stay awake. But that's what starts to happen. Your brain starts to get affected by that. And the more drugs you take, the more alcohol you take, it starts to mimic schizophrenia. Brain is so exhausted, it just literally shuts off. I've had it with, with, with methamphetamine addicts up three, four days, selling meth, doing meth. They want to paint an entire apartment complex. You know, it would normally take three weeks and do it in four days. They will literally fall asleep standing on a ladder and fall off, not even realizing it. They're so tired. You get stuck in an endless loop of an addiction cycle, and you just can't shut it off till you crash and burn if you survive. And I've seen this with addicts who go into emergency rooms all the time. The first thing that winds up happening if you're addicted to drugs, alcohol, all they want to do is sleep and eat. Sleep and eat because they haven't done neither one of them. So they sleep nonstop and they eat nonstop. Hey, you going to finish that sandwich? Hey, you got any more juice? Hey, any more peanut butter crackers? They eat, they're ravenous. They eat and it's like sleep, sleepy time all the time.
That's what happens. Okay. Um, how? Think they know what the problems are? Had me going crazy through the city while I burn it down. Yeah, it's interesting. He, the addict, is just as confused as everyone else. Why do, from my experience of assessing thousands of people, why do people abuse drugs and alcohol? For me, the biggest one, unresolved trauma from childhood. I could tell you that from working from any place I've worked at. When I started, like you start digging, digging, digging. What's the issue? Unresolved trauma from childhood that never got addressed and is still festering like a cancer. So if you don't want to deal with it, which we understand why you wouldn't, it's horrible, what do you do? You self-abuse. We don't want to talk to anybody, so what's the best way to do that? You over uh, Drug and alcohol, and the next one is overeating. I saw an article from a journal, 15%, they asked me the people that are overweight, women, why are they overweight? Sexual abuse. 15% of overweight women that are obese are hiding sexual abuse histories. I read that a few times. I thought, that's crazy. You know what I realized? There's some truth to that. There really is. 15% of overweight women are, it's for the, that 15% because of unresolved sexualized trauma that occurred to them. So it never get processed and it destroys you and it eats you up emotionally. You got to deal with the pain or the pain's going to eat you. And when I work with people, a lot of this happened to me hundreds of times, I'll go through like an assessment and I'll say, now you know why you do methamphetamine. Now you know why you smoke weed four or five times a week. Now you know why you're eating literally an entire seven layer cake at one sitting with an entire gallon of chocolate milk and then a dozen donuts and 50 Girl Scout cookies. Now you know why. It was unresolved trauma. You know, do you want to deal with it? What do you want to hide behind the sugar rush of that's where you're going to go? And when you think about sugar, you realize how addictive it is. And it, there's a reason why there's an obesity problem in this country. It's so readily available in so many, in so many products that we consume. Okay. Then this is just my way. Keep on praying for me. Lonely on my rod as I fly. Arms is open wide. He ends it beautifully or tragically. Either way. And I know it's not working. This is my and I know it's not working, so please pray for me. I get that a lot all the time too. Bruce, you you're a rabbi, I'm not a rabbi, but Bill, can you pray for me? Can you pray for me? Rabbi, pray for me. Rabbi, pray for me. Amazing how many times I actually will hold people's hands and I'll say, God bless this person to not be under the throes of addiction, to get better. And they, amen, Rabbi. I'm not, again, I'm not a rabbi. Okay, fine. But they want someone to pray for them because they realize they're helpless to combat the addiction. And how many times I've had family say to me, Bruce, I've worn out my knees from all the praying I've done over my son, my daughter, my wife, my husband, my cousin, my uncle, my sister, my grandfather. I've had addicts in their 70s. 70s. You think, come on, that's how powerful a drug and alcohol addiction can be. And you get this, you're very lonely. And that perspective that I'm flying, oh my God, how many songs have I read, listened to, and analyzed where the person describes I'm flying? And in general, people in the in the throes of addiction, you fly. What happens when you have to land? You crash land. You don't land on the runway smooth. You crash and burn. You touch the sun, burns you, you crash to the earth. That, that metaphor and so many of the music I've broken down over the last five years, I could just think of so many artists that have said this. I'm flying, I'm flying, I'm flying, I'm flying above it. You think you are. That's the illusion of an addiction. Okay. Then you go with don't want to leave without saying bye, had a rough night, find a sip some. Don't even worry about it, wait until the devil comes. Okay, let me tell you about the devil. My demons, all that is, your demons are just waiting to come out. It's not just having two drinks, I gotta have 12. I just can't have, you know, one line of Coke, I gotta do the entire eight ball. 
can't stop myself, can't stop, can't stop, can't stop. All that is, you're just waiting, you're just waiting for the devil to stop by because it's coming, he's coming, it's coming. You know, you know he's invited, just no matter when he has a chance to get to you because he's so busy dealing with so many other people that are dealing with their own issues, but he'll make time for you. Don't you worry. You can't, only, you can't keep that stuff quiet. It comes out of you. And then in verse 2, it goes like this. He's calling me. He's calling me. He's calling the inner me, the me that I want to be, the me that I, I'm trying to get to. And it goes, so much gone while I blow off steam and the blank's the same. So much gone while I blow off steam. I lost time, precious time that I can never get back and use in a productive manner. Yeah, I blow off steam. I got, I went crazy. I, I, I destroyed my house. I broke all the windows. What do I have to show for it? I blew off steam in an unhealthy manner. I got into a fight. I got arrested. I got sent to a psych ward. I got sent to be evaluated. My parents don't want to look at me anymore. I got evicted. I, I drove around drunk till the police finally stopped me, thank God, before I killed anyone or myself. Now I got to go to court. Yeah, I blew off steam. I'm having a rough day, rough life, rough time. What do I get to show for it? Nothing. Blew it off. Oh, look at that. Only you to blame, ha? Huh? It's like I'm swimming towards another bona fide life. Yeah. Yeah, only you to blame. All you are doing is you're burning more bridges. Because at a certain point, there's nothing left. You destroy everyone that's trying to open up their hands to you. Nothing to show for it. Only, oh, look at that. Only you to blame, huh? Yeah. So many people will say to me that it took them five years to burn all the bridges and 35 years to mend them. It's hard. You know, that's what addiction does to families, to friendships, to businesses, to your work history. Yeah. Yeah. Took me five years to burn everything. I, I did it. I finally stopped when I was 35. Now that I'm 65, I'm finally mending the bridges that I blew up. Yeah. Think about that. It's like I'm swimming towards another bona fide life. It's like a fairy tale wanting more. Fairy tale wanting more. Yeah. Great myth about drugs. I will become enlightened. I'll be different. I'll be better. Be a better person than I am now. Get a better understanding of myself. Wrong. Never happens. Every artist that has used drugs as a way to get better material, write better material, will always say, that was a bleak period of my musical career. Got nothing out of it. And when they're sober, they look at the music that they wrote, they're like, what was I thinking? This is terrible. This is garbage. This does, this does nothing. Your performances suffer. Your fans pick up on it. Everything. You know, when you're not on your A game, you think no one knows. Everyone knows. That's really what I'm really getting out of this song tonight from Kid Cudi. You, the only person you're fooling is yourself. There's an expression like, if you don't practice for one day, um, I think they were saying something like, you know. The second day, your manager knows. The third day, the fans know. When you're not on your game, it's obvious. People pick up. And then he goes like this. Um, Lord, he showed me that I'm tested and I'm going to fly. But in, I'm sorry. But inside I'm vexed. Used to question why. Lord, he showed me that I'm tested. I'm going to fly. I ain't slipping. No, that's not for me. Inside I'm the one troubled. Vexed. What a great word that he used. I'm going to steal that word. Vexed. I'm vexed. I'm vexed. I'm very vexed. Okay. It's a great word for that. Don't look too carefully at me. I'm in control. I'm in control. You're not. Everything about you is off. Until finally, you don't want to look in that mirror to see what you turned into. But I'm vexed. I'm vexed. I'm vexed. Meaning I'm in trouble. Then it goes like this. Take a drink. I live in excess. Nothing left. You know, and then you get this comment, which I really was impressed with. Be who you are. Don't be nothing less, please. Hear me, Lord. Don't ever leave, see. I'm a man in the night in these dark streets. Such a great line. Be who you are. 
That's the essence of it. So much of drugs and alcohol abuse and, and things that we do to self-destructive. Why? Because you don't like who you are. Your self-esteem is, is zero. Be who you are. Be happy with yourself. That, that is I, I, that's something I talk about all the time in the videos. Be happy with who you are. Be who you are. Until you get to that point, you'll never be able to be grounded. You'll always be looking for something in the wrong places, love in the wrong places, affirmation in the wrong places, self-gratitude in the wrong places. When you're finally happy with who you are, it's like such a calming effect. When your self-esteem, which we've talked about repeatedly in the, on these videos, is finally where it's supposed to be, that clicks in with your self-confidence, and all of a sudden, you don't need all these losers around you that tell you what you want to hear. You finally look at yourself objectively in the mirror and you move on. Such a great line. Be who you are. Be who you are. <sighs> you know, so many people in the throes of addiction can't look in the mirror. They hate the reflection. I always like to say to people who are in addiction, so you're going to break every mirror in the house? Is that the plan? You don't want to see what you turned into? You end up becoming a religious person. Go, let me believe that I'm still human. Hear me, Lord. Don't ever leave me. See, I'm a man in the night in these dark streets. Like they'll say, I'm praying because I prayed, I prayed, I prayed for God to end my life. I prayed for God to give me an answer. I prayed for, I prayed for clarity. I prayed for an end to this insanity. You, 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 oddly enough, you do become religious. And here it goes like this. You know, people have shared with me, you know what they did to survive on the streets, it's not pretty. You sell yourself, you debase yourself, you humiliate yourself, you embarrass yourself. That's what happens to you. How do you think you're going to pay for those drugs? Well, if you're not working a regular job, be creative. That's just what's going to happen to you anyway. And you just, you, you look at yourself in the mirror and you're like, did I turn into that kind of person? And the answer is you did. You get, you stripped away all your self-esteem and all your self-respect. You, and then people say this to me also, can you sink? Can you, can you sink lower? You, okay. It's very hard to go higher in life. That's not an easy thing to do. But to sink lower, always possible, always workable. Trust me. Okay. And then, every minute slipping away, this is hell. They were warning him. Figured he'd be cool. Who's the fool? Tick, tick, tick. It literally is hell on earth. Who's the fool now? What did it lead to? This is a great song. Great artist. I, you know, I have nothing to say anymore. I'm just so impressed with him and the way he puts everything together. The music and the lyrics, the words. He's a genius. What I think he's trying to say here is, I've had to confront my inner demons because I've made mistakes. I don't want you to do this. He's like almost like ripping his, you know, he's metaphorically becoming naked in front of us. For an artist, that's a huge thing to do. And that's why I have so much respect for him as a, not just as a musician, but as a man trying to make sense of his life. You know, we all look at him and think like, oh, Kid Cudi. You know, he's my God. He's my idol. But he's a human being and he struggles. And I think this song is really about understanding what people's struggles are. Give them a break, reach out, but don't get sucked up into that lifestyle because you're never going to beat it. You're never going to win from it. You're not going to come out of it wiser. Hopefully you come out of it alive with your brains not too scrambled. That's really it. That You don't have a stroke. That You don't have to be in a wheelchair the rest of your life. That you're not beaten to death. That you're not like lost control of this muscle or that. That's really what the song is telling me. Brilliant song, great artist. At the same time, I felt it would be it would be I would be in remiss if I didn't share with you some information about where drug usage is going and how federal authorities, state authorities, or whatever are looking at drug usage. Here we go. The war on drugs for a very long time was not based on science. Okay, it was based on bias. Okay. This is said this was said in 1971 by then President Richard Nixon. It goes, America's public enemy number one 
the United States is drug abuse, public enemy. He coined the term the war on drugs. And that began to define federal policy towards drug usage for the next half century. Today, half a million people across the U.S. are incarcerated for, shockingly, drug-related offenses, including 50% in federal prisons. Yet more than half a million people still die of overdoses each year. It doesn't make any sense. Those who are marginalized because of their race, class, sexuality, or other factors bear the overwhelming burden of criminal drug policy. This is from, this is from a, uh, a doctor. In spite of the fact that substance use rates are equivalent across demographics, including racial demographics. People always go like this to me. Oh, it's not, no, not me. Not me. It's them. Those people. People that look like that. People that live there. No, not me. Not in my neighborhood. No, no, no. Not in my neighborhood. No, not my religion. No, 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 no. Not my background. Not my education. Wrong. It cuts across all stratas, all areas. It affects everybody equally. There's no drug-free zone, trust me. One example of historical difference is historical is sentencing between crack cocaine and powder cocaine, which chemically are largely the same drug in different forms. You don't really see crack anymore. I think meth has just kind of exploded and taken over everything. But when I was growing up, crack was whack, was like huge. That was a big thing back in the 70s and 80s. Fine. Okay. But here's what happened, though. It didn't change anything. Certain people were put in because crack usage. But cocaine and crack are the same family. Here's the thing. More than $1 trillion dollars has been directly spent on war on drug initiatives in the past four decades, yet use continues as a steady rise. A 2018 study in the journal Science found that overdose deaths have increased exponentially and along a remarkably smooth trajectory in the past 40 years. Going up. What changed, the paper found, was the drugs of choice. Specifically, the targeted approach to policy left the country unprepared to handle the opioid addiction crisis, which first impacted white communities with illegal painkillers, Oxycontin. It changed everything, okay? Opioids killed 76,000 people in 2018, representing the majority of the 67,000 recorded overdose deaths, which we know are vastly underreported. Here's the thing. What Oregon has decided to do as of February 1st is decriminalization of certain classes of drugs. And when they've done this in five different states for another researcher, 75% reduction in arrests related to cannabis possession for kit youths and a 78%, 80% basically drop for adults. Youth numbers are a particularly important public health metric because drug use in that age bracket Common sense is a strong determinant of an individual's behavior in adulthood. If you're using drugs as a, as a teenager, you tend to use it as an adult. Okay, here's the point. Measure 110 became law in Oregon on February 1st. As of February 1st, people will not be arrested or put in jail if caught with a schedule 1 to 4 narcotic, including heroin, crystal meth, LSD, and a quantity likely to be for their own personal use. And the exact, the exact amounts vary by the substance, obviously. While shifts in cannabis policy have in many cases led to a booming commercial industry, no one is advocating that seriously dangerously addicted drugs be advertised and sold to the masses. Okay, the, the consequences of cannabis commercialization are still being studied by multiple research teams but they're showing the potential seems to be lower than those of another commercial drug, alcohol. Here's the key change. It's not that which drugs are legal in Oregon, but rather than how the state treats illegal drugs. Instead of a Class A fent misdemeanor, those found with personal amounts of illicit substances will now be charged with a Class E violation, which comes with no jail time or mark on a criminal record. That's huge. So many lives have been screwed up because of having criminal records. Can't get a job, you can't vote, so you get marginalized. 
But just a few years ago, Possession Oregon needed a felony charge. You either get an option of paying a $100 fine or getting a health assessment. That checkup will set them up to attend state-funded and monitor treatment, but you're not forced to follow through. Treat you like an adult. It's very hard to engage people in follow-up and care when they're in and out of jails and being chased around by police. This is another researcher. Decriminalization isn't a magic bullet, but it will help, he says. Criminalizing drugs disproportionately harms poor people and people of color. And by decriminalizing everything across the board, the law eliminates potentially base distinct, biased distinctions between drugs, exemplified by the federal hair splitting between forms of cocaine. What's the point? There's options out there. You know, we get it. Drugs are horrible. Alcohol abuse is horrible. It's dreadful. And these songs are good barometers to understand that. But now there are options that we're finally coming to our senses. The way we've done things before is stupidity. People need treatment to get the help. We got to get past the drug usage to deal with what really is causing you to be so self destructive, generally unresolved childhood trauma, PTSD. That's what we got to start doing. And until we get to that point that we see things for what they really are, you're, okay, who in their right mind wants to be an addict? Who in their right mind wants to live in a tunnel under the Las Vegas Strip? It's insane. Who wants to be a prostitute? Who wants to live on the streets? Who wants to live, you know, in the desert? That's out here in Vegas. You got to be out of your mind. Who would want to live like that? Who wants to be arrested, lose everything, stripped of all your dignity? You got to be in incredible pain. Finally, we're getting some answers, guys, some perspectives on how things are going. For those of you who are going to watch this video, give me your thoughts on that. If you have a drug history, alcohol history, or you have a parent or someone that you love dealing with that kind of stuff, how has it affected your life? How has it affected your thinking? Does this kind of thinking make sense into going forward with that kind of way of looking at it? Not to criminalize everything. Of course, you're caught with 20 pounds of meth. You're probably, you know, a supplier. We get that. That guy should go to jail. We understand that. But if you're just using enough for yourself, let's offer you a chance to get clean. That's my point. Kid Cudi, once again, you blew me away. You know, I'm one of your biggest fans. But I wanted to share this article. I want to kind of get to a point of saying we need to think and change how we're doing things. And our challenge, not just about breaking down music, but also giving solutions and advice, help you grow so you're not caught in this endless cycle of self-destruction. That's it. Bruce Moffson, LCSW, Sunridge, Nevada.